Hi, everyone, and welcome to ABC's of Anesthesia. And, you know, I feel like every time I do a different kind of episode, there's just so many different things that we can talk about in, in, in this podcast and YouTube format. But so today I've got Max Green, soon to be Dr. Max. Um, and Max contacted me, uh, you know, maybe a month ago or so, because you were about to sit this anesthetic prize, prize exam with the University of Tasmania. Um, so, yeah, welcome, Max. Thanks for coming along to this podcast. Um, yeah, can you tell us about um, where you're at in medicine? Why did you contact me and how all that came about? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so in terms of where I'm at in medicine, my name's Max Green. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Tasmania um, up at their rural clinical school based out of Burnie. Um, and yeah, I contacted uh, the ABCs of Anesthesia podcast. I've been listening to some episodes sort of in the lead up to that prize exam around sort of drugs and how to approach things and found them really helpful. So I reached out and just to see if there was any advice and yeah, that's how this has sort of all come about. Awesome. And I, and I think that's really cool because I've never, I've obviously I've started this podcast a couple of years ago and uh, with Kaz and uh, you know, we, we, every time there's a new opportunity in how we can talk about some level of education, a, a you know, medical student or specialist or whatever. And so maybe the audience would be wondering, maybe they're medical students out there, like if they want to be eligible for a prize exam in, you know, in medicine, in medical school, like how does that even come about? Yeah, for sure. So I can talk about how it works for us in our uni. Uh, so we had um, the opportunity to sort of sign up for these exams. So you elect at the end of having sat all of your normal exams that I'd like the opportunity to sit a prize exam. We sat in MCQ, uh, went for about an hour, and then they took the top three performances from the University of Tasmania. And, and that's we all then sat a that's the general medical MCQ, not an anesthetic MCQ. No, it was an anesthetic MCQ. Oh, so you choose to yeah. go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, so we signed up for a specific anesthetic MCQ. And then from that anesthetic MCQ, they took the top three performers. And then we sat a live Viva type examination. Which is the one you were asking me about. Yeah. Now, and then just to give it perspective, how many people, uh, uh, opted for more pain and more examinations? <laughs> it's really difficult to say. Um, there were 10 or so at my clinical school and I'm not sure what it looked like around the state, but yeah, I think they had a reasonably good turnout. Everyone seems to really enjoy their anesthetic rotation. Yeah, that's cool. So uh, this is definitely something like a lot of the specialty exams are very opt-in and I, I, you know, you'd highly recommend that people have a go at these because it's not like you've got 200 people opting mm. to do these exams. You've got lower numbers and if you do do well, like, you know, you came third in that and you're eligible for this that's a really big stepping stone if you can say you've got a prize at anything which is already difficult in med school when you're amongst like some really brilliant academic performers you kind of got to find these niches where your odds of winning are higher and i, I think that's that's really great that you put your hat in for that yeah absolutely i echo that for sure if anyone ever gets the opportunity to sit these exams the worst thing that's going to happen is you go in and you might learn something at the end of the day so i think it's well worth uh pursuing it exactly um hey so maybe for this podcast we'll take you know uh who knows how long it's going to go but let's say 30 minutes or so i'll find out about what it was initially let's go let's why don't we talk about what was it like in the vibe and not the questions itself but you know what was the vibe of it how many examiners what you know, how was it friendly was it conversational very much Question, question, question. Yeah, so the Viva was sat over Zoom uh, with two consultants from uh, hospitals in the region um, and it was conversation-based. So they gave us three clinical scenarios and then expanded on sort of the anaesthetic concepts that those three scenarios brought up and asked questions based on what your sort of approach was to each of those scenarios. Okay, cool. Um, and so this could be a really great learning opportunity. Now, Max, I, there's, there's pretty good memory work from you. So you broadly remember what the, the stems were, the like the scenario, and you've now written down some questions that you remember. So it'll be maybe great. So you, you can ask me these questions as if I was the person sitting the exam. Uh, and then I'll kind of talk to you about how I would answer it, um, generally speaking. And hopefully that will be useful for anyone else who might come across these situations. We've, we've already gone through some of these 
kind of the overall questions already. And I've got to say, it's a fantastic spread of what would be required by any medical student and junior doctor in the anesthetic space. So I think some of the stuff you mentioned was like pain management stuff, um, like general issues with um, a patient having an operation. So, you know, operative issues for a specific problem. And then uh, doctor's ABC stabilization of a sick patient, which is essentially covering a lot of the basics of what we'd like medical students and junior doctors to know. Yeah, no, I think it was a really good spread and a good fair sort of test of our knowledge and a good opportunity to present the things that we've learned on placement and might have researched leading up to it. Yeah, okay. Well, let, let's go. Uh, tell me what the situations were and yeah, ask me the, the questions and I'll, and I'll share with you how I think I approach, I would approach it as a specialist anesthetist. So the first scenario centered around um, a patient you're asked to see on your anesthetic rotation. So you're called to the ward, um, asked to assess a 78 year old uh, female patient who's been experiencing some pain. Um, she was admitted with a fractured neck of femur and she's currently waiting for theater. So that was the scenario. And before, and then, before you go on, as soon as I hear this scenario, I'm thinking three things, obviously pain management and it's an approach to that. And I'm thinking it's a trauma, you know, fracture of anything is a trauma and has the trauma screen been done and is the patient safe, kind of a sick patient assessment slash trauma screen. And I'm thinking, oh, fracture never femur, high mortality, palliative operation for pain relief. So, uh, you know, relatively urgent 48 hour operation. Those three things are in my, uh, things that I'm flagging already. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. So the next thing that we sort of covered was how you'd go about assessing this patient for pain. Yeah, cool. And so as soon as I see assessment of anything, I think either doctors ABCD if they're sick and then history examination investigations if they're well, because they're going straight to asking about pain, I'd probably just go uh, assess from history, examination investigations, what the pain's like. And this would be, you know, talking to the patient. So finding out the history of what had happened and then doing all the pain questions and not, not just the fractured femur, but also the rest of the body. Are there any other sites of trauma? And, you know, asking about, you know, the, the site, the radiation, the severity, the, um, you know, the number out of 10, the character, the periodicity, the onset, the offset, aggravating, relieving associated factors. And I get those out pretty quickly because they're easy to remember. And then I start looking at examination, you know, is this just the pain there or is there other problems with um, neuro neuropathic pain, burning, cold, you know, sharp tingling sensations, uh, neurovascular compromise might be a thing um, in other fractures, maybe not so much in hips. Um, and then investigation. So you'll always get a check, you always get an x ray of the site. And that then uh, would lead on to what is the best management of that pain. So that's probably how to assess, broadly speaking, uh, yeah, the assessment of pain in that patient. Is it yeah, that sounds. No, that sounds really comprehensive. Um, I suppose if you were asking the patient in real life, how would you actually sort of structure those questions? You mentioned sort of severity. Are there any particular scales or tools that you like to use when you're assessing a patient like this? Yeah, so essentially if they're English speaking and understand things, I'd say zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain, what number are you? And then I'd try to assess the improvement of that with various things and pain management and how it's progressed along. Um, as well as function activity scores. So, you know, mm. can they do anything? And in most fractured neck of femur fascia, they're, they're bed bound, they're in a lot of pain, um, especially if they move. So I'm not really concerned about the fact that their low function, functional activity score of C is usually the case there. Um, and then as I mentioned, I'm really checking for the red flag stuff because un unlike other pain, this pain is known. So, or, you know, mostly known. So I just, I'm really just confirming, is it fractured neck of femur? And is there any other bad stuff like neurovascular compromise or, you know, did they have a pain syndrome that's now aggravated substantially or is the existing pain management not working and they're in a crisis pain situation, which I've got to add stuff to. This is all very advanced stuff, but, you know, it's not, it's not that hard. It's a bit logical as well. So, you know, we're thinking about. Yeah. So once you've assessed this patient's pain, Lahir, how would you go about sort of providing some pain relief and what would be some considerations around that? Yeah, fantastic. So. Uh, and by the way, if you definitely feel free to mention anything I've forgotten, because I'm just doing this on the fly, I'll probably forget some stuff, which is cool. You go, oh, by the way, I, I added this. That is yeah. very useful for anyone who's listening and watching. Uh, yeah, so my approach to this would be firstly thinking that this patient is in a lot of pain uh, and may or may not have some at that age, may need extra care, may not have the ability to maybe ask for 
pain relief or operate a PCA. So I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking about the fact that they need an urgent operation for treating the pain as much as the fracture itself. And my approach would be multimodal analgesia, as well as knowing that this patient might need stronger opioids, smaller doses of you know, oxycodone endone, maybe morphine through a PCA or fentanyl through a PCA, one milligram or 10 to 20 mics, depending on the patient's wellness, um, and even more ketamine and a nerve block. So often these patients get a fasciolarca block or a femoral nerve block, and that's just a mainstay. As soon as they get into ED in my hospital, they get this block, and that really sorts them out and avoids all the problems of elderly patients having narc you know, narcotics and the risk of sedation and respiratory depression uh, in patients that are very potentially very sensitive to it. So, yep, paracetamol, one, one gram QID as a max dose, depending on the renal function, liver function. Uh, non steroidals, again, maybe a concern in the elderly. Tramadol, I'd watch what other serotonergically active drugs they're on and then put, give them a small dose, like 50 milligrams TDS, depending on the size of this patient. Um, oral IV, and then start them on a small dose vendor and 2.5 milligrams oral every two to three hours. Again, titrating to how how um, depressed their respiration might get. But I'd have a low threshold for putting it, getting them on a PCA and even a small ketamine infusion if they've got uncontrollable pain. And I'm not able to put a fascia iliac, iliac and nerve block in. Yeah, no, that sounds fantastic. So I suppose one thing that you mentioned was sort of NSAID use and query whether you'd use that in this patient or in the elderly at all i think that's pretty good medical student sort of knowledge so what are some things that you might consider when prescribing an NSAID? yeah i, I just think of all the contraindications really mm. so lead risk for this case w- won't be a big deal so i don't well, yeah. consider that a problem uh definitely I look at their renal function any renal function deterioration i would not give NSAIDs. it's such a problem with acute renal failure that i just wouldn't uh i then look for any problems with gastritis sensitivity to it with asthma um, and then, yeah, the coagulopathy stuff. Um, uh, generally, we talk about being cautious with selective COX-2 inhibitors, mm-hmm. and cardiac disease. Um, so assuming that that's not a problem, I'll, I, I, would, I would go ahead. So even after all of, let's say all of those things are negative, no asthma, no gastritis, no kidney problems, I'd still be cautious. Like I'd probably put them on a short course of it, like maybe, you know, ibuprofen 400 milligrams twice a day, uh, and just for a couple of days around the operative period. Um, and again, I might not even need it. It would just really depend on how effective the fascia and the alcohol block is, how effective the opioids are. Um, it's easier in my world to treat a bit of sedation than to yeah. treat failure, you know? So I'm kind of balancing those two things. Yeah, for sure. The other thing I suppose that, and you've mentioned a couple of different modes of analgesia in that sort of answer, mm. but the next thing that comes up is, probably multimodal analgesia and what sort of the understanding is around that and how it's used and why, you know, in this patient, you might consider taking that approach or in any patient. It's a really great medical student question because it, it, it kind of underlines this, a principle that we use in some situations, but not in others. Multimodal meaning we're going to, we're going to, we're going to try and approach pain by attacking many of the different mechanisms of pain um, with many different medications. So what this means, I get better pain relief, but hopefully also limit the side effects of each of them. And you think of all the pain pathways, you've got your prostaglandins from which um, net non-steroidals stop with inflammation, opioid receptors, paracetamol and some curious central action and unknown action, (laughs) serotonergically active like tramadol with noradrenaline and descending inhibition in the central pathways. And then even though each of those receptors will have different sites as well. So we're really trying to get pain controlled with multiple receptor actions and then decrease the side effects of each of those. And you'll find this as an example in, uh, I guess, multimodal uh, nausea and vomiting management, um, but you then, and, and multimodal blood pressure management, but then you don't find it in things like, um, say, treating epilepsy. I think you don't want to be trying too many things or antidepressants. Like you want to, lower one and then raise the other because of potential severe uh, uh, interactions between these drugs. So multimodal is great, but not always used in depending on the circumstance. Yeah. And in terms of sort of that approach to multimodal, and we sort of touched on, I suppose, the WHO analgesic ladder. Mm. Are there things that you, you know, add first, just for a very basic, for a medical student, you know, things that you add first and then build upon? Absolutely. So this is exactly the principles of multimodal and the WHO analgesic ladder just shows this stepwise addition of things. So you're not giving too many things and you're not going straight to strong, risky medications when 
simple, less overall, re- less risky medications will do. So if I was a medical student, I would definitely use the word multimodal. I'll use the word allergenic ladder in WHO. And then I'd say I'd start with a with a paracetamol and give a dose, one gram oral IV, QID, regular or PRN depending. Add on the non-steroidal. These, these um, simple allergies are easy to add on at the same time. And give again, give whatever you feel like. Ibuprofen, 400 milligrams, TDS, oral. Uh, and then add on the weak opioids, either codeine or tramadol. Most anesthetists would give tramadol, but rarely give it codeine because of the d- various pharmacokinetic issues with it and pharmacogenetic problems. And then strong opioids on top of that afterwards and other adjuncts such as your know, antineuropathics and your clonidines and yeah, uh, a whole bunch of other weird and wonderful drugs. But that, yeah, that approach mentioned- of, Sorry, go on. Sorry. Yeah, no, you got that approach of you say a principle, you say the drug, and then you quickly go for the dose instead of being prompted for it is what we would like all our trainees, whether medical student or otherwise to do. You're just giving information in this nice story fashion without needing prompting. And it shows a level of, I know this scenario in its whole context. I don't need, uh, often with the junior trainees, we, we, try, we have to try and get information out of them. So as a student, if you can get information out quickly, that seems reasonable to talk about, you tell the whole story of the management and then it, it just sounds like a better answer. Uh, I, I mean, that's my opinion, but I, I, I see this a lot So, in examining. Absolutely. And I suppose some advice that you gave to me that I found really helpful is that, you know, taking broad concepts or a broad sort of framework approach. So laying down, as you said, sort of that, I'm going to use multimodal analgesia, I'm going to follow the, you know, WHO ladder, getting those broad frameworks and then filling in your knowledge so that the examiners know that you know what you're talking about and like you're saying, are aware of the scenario and that you know what's going on and have a sort of systems-based approach that you're going to take into these patients. It's always a difference between saying, I'm going to give paracetamol, saying a dose, I'm going to give this. It's almost like you tell them the destination and then you tell them the specifics. So they already know you've got the answer and they can move on quickly if they're, if they're not examining on the dose of ibuprofen. So yeah, good strategy, but also yeah, let's, let's give them confidence in your knowledge and abilities. The other thing that we mentioned as you were talking about the multimodal analgesia was decreasing those side effects mm-hmm. of things like opiate medication. And the next sort of area that we touched on was, you know, are there any other drugs that you'd consider prescribing alongside their pain relief? And how would you go about that? Yeah. So if we're not talking about extra pain relief medications, I'm thinking mm. of, first of all, the medical problems that they might have, but I just, and, and all the drugs I could be giving for, you know, high blood pressure and, you know, g- generally supplementing vitamin D for elderly patients and checking their blood levels and giving them, you know, iron and stuff like that. But let's say we're not talking about any of those general medical things. I'm thinking about the, the drug and its side effects and how I'm going to manage those side effects that are unwanted. So opioids are the easy one to think about. Opioids can often cause nausea and constipation. So everyone gets at least two antiemetics on Danstron, four milligrams TDS oral IV, Maxilon, 10 milligrams oral IV, TDS PRN as well. And then laxative, everyone gets lactulose 20 mils BD as a still softener and also Cloxin, Zena, two tablets, BD, PRN. Um, and the, the rule there is every patient must pass their bowels at least once a day. Uh, and if not, you need to sort that out because you know, having a bowel obstruction due to opioids and treatment is just not, a, you just, you, you don't let that happen on your ward. I'm trying to yeah. think what and do you think doing. that's oh information that you volunteer as part of your answer? So we talked about that framework and knowing the final destination. When you talk about prescribing these drugs, do you think it's useful to sort of consider that co-prescribing? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, we, 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 as, a, as a junior doctor, you'll be writing out lots and lots mm. of drugs. Every time you write an opioid down, straight away it goes into writing the laxatives and the and the um, antimedics, and that and that's saving your time. Because guaranteed, some percentage of patients will then need it, and not only will the patient have a delay in receiving the medication, but your nurse has to call you and take your time, which is so limited as an intern and junior doctor. Um, and then worse worse than that, imagine it's overnight. The patient waits for longer, and they call your mate on night cover with a hundred jobs to do. And that was the worst thing. Like we had a really good team when I was doing nights, where everyone was so thorough. I can't remember ever really getting asked to write up anti medicine appearance in the hospital I trained. People were so on it um, because we know that covering, you know, making sure you're thorough means that 
you're not having to cover other people's um you know things that they've omitted um yeah and then and actually things like non-steroid paracetamol there's no real major side effects of that but non-steroidals let's say someone does get gastritis or has already some level of gastritis but you really want to give non-steroidals an advanced technique which i don't suggest for everyone to do would be to give a, a, a very cautious dose of non-steroidals plus um and uh, you know a ppi like nexium as a um as well uh, and that just kind of harm minimizes things may, maybe I think that's probably the first scenario covered really well and focusing sort of on that pain management. Sure. Um, so the second scenario mm. that we went into was around sort of a patient who's got a high BMI and sort of some anesthetic considerations there. So you know, imagine you're a resident on your anesthetic rotation um, and you started to anaesthetize a 50-year-old female um, for an elective uh, total laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy mm -hmm. she's otherwise well but as i sort of said she's got a bmi of 40 mm -hmm. um so what would be i suppose some or did you want to talk about what you're sort of thinking right off yeah, the bat with this patient exactly so i i think of um and i go through this in some of my lectures of like a summary statement or how you present cases to your boss when i think of this i think age gender which is you know they've already given that so what is it like a 50 year old female so 50 year old female elective or urgent so there's an elective lap coli so elective procedure is it high or low risk generally speaking and so this is a relatively low risk procedure because it's just a lap coli in a patient who's obese i then identify the critical issue so uh uh so in this case like we, a bmi 40 patient means that i've got certain increased risk of the anesthetic maybe the airway and maybe the operation for the surgeon as well um, and then the advanced stuff I might think, which isn't so relevant in this, is who else do I need to contact specialist-wise? Um, and probably no one at this point, unless they had like diabetes or some other issue. Um, and what center do I do this in? And this would be done in any, you know, tertiary center or even, even a non-tertiary center. It'd be totally safe to do it in that center. So just to recap, I'd, I'm thinking of a quick summary. Age, gender. So there's a 50-year-old female having an elective relatively low risk operation, the major issues being the high BMI, which could have some operative issues and some uh, anesthetic issues, especially with a high BMI and having an airway and having the appropriate abdominal pressures and um, and things like that. Yeah, so that's probably how it'd start. Yeah, and I think you've touched on probably some of them already, but mm. you know, what are those anesthetic considerations that you'd make in this patient? So before you provide any sort of anesthetic what would you do in terms of a pre-op assessment what are you asking patients how would you approach that oh great yeah so always think pre-operative intraoperative post-operative so pre-operative specifically i'll do my full anesthetic assessment but specifically with a patient who's got a high bmi so again i'm doing all the usual stuff which i'm not going to go through unless they ask me but i will mention that i'm going to think about it usual anesthetic assessment but i'm specifically concerned about the obesity issues and now you've got to think Oh my God, obesity means so many things. As a medical student, it's going to be hard to just outline these. I reckon having just an approach where you think about everything that could happen uh, in an obese patient. So first of all, I'm thinking um, general medical stuff. Uh, what is the actual weight? And can the hospital even you know, deal with that weight in this, in this patient? Maybe they're really short, really large, or maybe they're six foot and you know it, the weight isn't too bad. Well, I mean, whatever it is, the BMI is 40, it's going to be pretty high. I'm thinking what happens with large patients, difficulty positioning, difficulty getting access for lines and blood pressure cuffs might not fit and you need different size cuffs. I'm thinking metabolic syndrome type stuff, diabetes, maybe they've got increased heart disease, maybe they have OSA and worse yet, obesity hyperventilation syndrome. So I'm thinking of all the medical conditions I'm going to be you know, uh, you know, assessing them for sever severity, so stability, are they treated um, and what are any problems with the treatments that they already had. So that's my framework for that. Um, and then I'm thinking operatively, it's a longer operation. So, you know, I might have to, uh, you know, plan for that, maybe give some more fluid, maybe um, just make sure I've got enough pain management afterwards, make sure positioning is absolutely, um, you know, proper. So they don't have any pressure areas and pressure sores. I'm thinking DVT prophylaxis. I'm thinking increased dose of everything, but especially antibiotics and redosing if it's a longer operation. Um, and then, yeah, I'm thinking airways. So often airways don't have to be difficult, but depending on the airway examination, it could be very challenging. Um, respiratory mechanics as well um, with patients who are obese, the decreased functional residual capacity, decreased oxygen store, 
difficulty. It's like an obstructive ventilation pattern. So restrictive ventilation patterns after high airway pressures. A lot of things are more difficult just because of the obesity. So I've just kind of done, I've tried a little bit of a framework and I've just given lots of issues that may come up as I've thought about them. And I think it'd be hard as a medical student to just think of all those things, but I think giving some of those things shows that you're looking at obesity in a kind of a holistic way. Yeah, I think so. And in terms of that sort of, framework mm. it sounds like you were vaguely breaking it down into sort of patient factors anesthetic factors surgical factors yeah. if you were gonna you know take a broad approach do you think that sort of works for I, yeah. that sort of question i i probably stretched it a bit far in like i think you specifically asked me preoperative mm, so i probably yeah. should have just mentioned you know the usual stuff and then extra medical issues they might have and my airway assessment and then definitely introp introp i should have then go on to patient, surgical, and, intra and and anesthetic factors. So I think, yeah, using those categories would definitely help. And I probably stretched my answer out in the intro in the preoperative phase. No, that's all right. Um, I think the next thing that sort of we talked about in the examination was how you'd assess a patient's airway. Do you have a good approach? Yeah, beautiful. Like, how do you like to tackle this one? Every airway assessment, like any other assessment, is history, examination, investigation. And it's interesting because no matter what examination findings you find, like Mal and Patty, Thyromental, whatever, it's the previous history of airway grade that's the most predictive of future difficulty. So I would look, I'd look at the previous anesthetic records. What was the airway? What was used to manage this airway? What's the bag mass difficulty, LMA difficulty, intubation difficulty in grade? And that would be my gold standard. And then I would do an airway assessment. Maybe this patient hasn't had a management in a long time. So I'm going to do you know, general inspection, mouth opening, mal and patty, thorough mental distance, neck extension, jaw protrusion, um, and any other. And that's probably the main test that I'd do. This patient on, after examination probably wouldn't need any investigations. Now, the most important thing that a lot of medical students won't realize is after doing a, a good history and examination, then the way you formulate your answer is not about the actual um, the data points that you found on examination or history. It's, I think this, I would then try to figure out whether this patient was going to be a difficult bag mask, LMA or intubation. And that's the way I always think about it. No matter what my findings are, I think about it in terms of how I'm going to, you know, achieve a good airway rather than just looking at a thorough mental distance in isolation or a mouth opening isolation. Yeah, I think that's an excellent way of thinking about it, that end result as opposed to sort of, you know, I'm looking at all of these different factors and working out how that actually will affect my patient and affect how you might go about giving the anaesthetic. Yeah. In terms of that, I suppose they, they are some, sorry. And when you and when you think about that, like it's, let's say you do the examination, this kind of advanced stuff, but it's easy enough to learn, so worth thinking about. If, you're, if your consultant asks what the airway examination is and you do it and you find some findings, it, it, you know, to, to share findings is level one, but to synthesize the findings like we're talking about into a result of presumed difficulty of this, this, or this, that shows like a synthesis of knowledge. That, that's like the next level up. And that's what we're trying to get people to learn as they're training to synthesize information and, you know, put something out that, um, that their findings have suggested. So in terms of reporting those findings at a, final year medical student level, what would you expect someone to say that they look for in an airway assessment? Yeah, I would expect them to say, I'd look at the previous anesthetic record and look for the airway assessment there. I would do a general inspection, mouth opening, mal and patty, thyroid mental distance, the neck extension and jaw protrusion, and obviously looking for dentition problems as well. If you were to do that, I think that's brilliant. Like not many medical students will just rattle those six or seven principles off quickly. But if you were to then go, if they gave you some findings, and then mm -hmm. you were like, oh, mouth opening is two centimeters. And then you were to say, wow, logically, that's going to be hard to put a laryngoscope in and LMA is going to be hard to put down. Um, if the mal and patty is a grade three or four, that shows overcrowding. Maybe intubation is difficult then. Um, maybe bag masking will be difficult because there's overcrowding. If you start taking the findings and synthesizing them, that is almost registrar level. Um, and it's just the fact that you haven't done much anesthetics as a med student that you wouldn't be doing that. So baseline, do the findings, get some results, and hopefully you can logically extrapolate some data to impress the examiners with that. 
I think that makes a lot of sense and taking all of those findings and synthesizing them, if you can, a great way of going about it, whether you're at that level or not at the final year medical student, I'll leave that up to everyone. But um, I guess the next thing I sort of asked was to describe sort of how you'd go about assessing a malampati and how that grading system works. I'm not sure if you want to talk about that here or whether people can go and look that up. Oh, I've actually, so, I'm going to put a little ad for my ABC's Anesthesia Foundations mm -hmm. course. Um, so all of the stuff that we're going through here, I've got a, a foundation course with a full online course where I, I literally go through all the basic anesthesia. Like this is for my quick care residents doing their, or, or anyone doing their first six to 12 months of anesthetics. But I've got to say, it's not complex stuff. If you just, you know, learn it at any stage, it will be useful. So I'll just put a link in, you know, in, in this video for that. Um, and potentially a link is already there at the start of this video because that's how I've edited it. So yeah, that, that would be where I'd say, go look at the airway stuff in that in that course and you'll see all the things you know about Mel and Patty, but I won't, yeah, not, not worth going through in too much detail now. You can just look it up. Yeah, sounds great. So I suppose, yeah, they asked us about Mel and Patty and they asked us about sort of your view on direct laryngoscope and how you then assess those things if people were wanting to go and read up on those. I think it'd be a really useful thing oh, to so do. They asked you, mm. did they show you a grade? A, 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 but they said, how would you grade a laryngoscopic view of the vocal cords? I'll yeah, so basically describe what you would see on direct view for, okay. you know, Cochlear and Lohane, is that? Yeah, Cormac Lohane. So Cormac Lohane, uh, sorry, I've butchered uh, that. But <laughs> yes, how you would look and what you would see at each grade of that. Beautiful. And and again, so you yeah, have a look at the diagrams I've got in the course or even just um, Google Cormac Lohane, uh, C-O-R-M-A-C-K dash L-E-H-A-N-E. -E. Have a look at that. And they love asking questions like, yeah, what do you see when you're down there? And or, you know, you're putting a spiral in. What are the layers you go through? People love asking those very simple things, but they're actually complicated because you haven't thought about it. <laughs> so the, at, at the base level, you describe the, the base of the tongue, the vollecular, the vocal cords. That's the base. That's the minimal. And if you really were about to impress someone, you talk about the area epiglottic falls, the true cords, the false cords, the, uh, you know, the corniculum and the... um oh my God, the, and the cuneiform uh, cartilage and maybe the arotenoid cartilage, depending on the view. So you can go to a different level of that, but at a medical student level, tongue, uh, vellecular and epiglottis and vocal cords would be fine. Yeah, no, that sounds excellent. And I would encourage people to go and look that up. I think it's a very fair question to get asked on this sort of examination. Yeah. Um, so Bearing all of that in mind and having done your airway assessment and all of those sorts of things, what sort of anaesthetic would you use in this patient um, and sort of why and what type of airway device? Yeah. So what sort of anaesthetic? This would be a, a relaxed and general anaesthetic. So when they ask that question, it's such a, it seems like a broad question, but really, are you going to do a GA or regional or sedation? Lapco is always a GA. Are you going to need paralysis or not? Because there's intracavity surgery, you always need paralysis to optimize your surgical view. Otherwise, the muscles contract with the hemoperitoneum. And then most, and, and then do you need to put an endotracheal tube or an LMA or nothing? And because of the high pressures and a few other reasons, you, you need to put a tube in for this. So relaxant general anesthetic with a tube is my anesthetic. Um, the specifics of that, I think, so, you know, how would you do your anesthetic? You can get into a lot of detail with this, but you could essentially say, do, assuming the airway isn't too much of a problem, I would still use a video laryngoscope to optimize my first best view. And it's such a common device these days. I think that's the extra thing you do because you're worried about the BMI making the airway more difficult, maybe. So I might just add on to that. And the advanced thing you could say, which again, medical students wouldn't know is, because they are potentially a difficult bag mass ventilation, solely from looking at the BMI being high, I would give a fast acting muscle relaxant because that would make my bag masking and intubating conditions optimized. Advanced stuff, but just think of the, if your muscles are like tight in a large patient, it's harder to manage an airway. If you paralyze them, it becomes nice and loose and the airway is a lot easier to manage. Again, advanced level stuff, but that would be the extra thing I'd mention. And I'd use rocuronium at a high dose or succinothonium. And what about for the anesthetic itself? What sort of agents would you look at? Yeah, great. So I'd run these patients mainly on volatile anesthetic. So uh, maintenance with volatile, induction with propofol. Um, so I'm thinking hypno the triad, so hypnosis, mm. analgesia, muscle paralysis. 
and then the extra things, which is anti-emetics, antibiotics, DVT, prophylaxis, and long-term analgesics. So those that's the way I kind of think about the main drugs. So profile induction, maintenance with sevoflurane, titrated dose of fentanyl throughout the case, um, and then muscle paralysis with the rocuronium I gave at the start with incremental doses depending on recovery of muscle function. I'd give two antiemetics at least, providing there's no post-operative nausea vomiting other risk factors. I would give DVT prophylaxis, at, you know, in a high BMI patient, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram subcut uh, as per the surgeons. I'd give two grams or more uh, if, if they're above 120 Ks of uh, kefazolin. Um, and then I'd give all my post-op laxatives, antimedics, and analgesics after that as well. Sounds excellent to me. Um, <laughs> I think that was probably pretty much all that we covered in that scenario. Is there anything else that you think is really worth going over in this sort of patient? Or We're definitely going else you over this at a reasonably high level. Like this is mm -hmm. me talking kind of register level yeah. stuff. But again, once you've heard it and once you see some patterns, it's not too difficult to add this on. So you imagine you go into your medical student viva, don't get intimidated by this conversation, um, but just know, oh, assessment of airway, history, examination, investigation, and learn some data points. Um, how do you do this anesthetic? Oh, good. I'm going to say it's a general or regional, paralysis or none, ETT or LMA, easy three things to talk about instead of getting lost in other detail. Um, what type of medications are you giving? Great. My framework is at hypnosis, um, paralysis, analgesia. And that's, if you said that, fantastic. And if you want to get extra marks, you go, oh, what are the A's? Antibiotics, anti-emetics, extra analgesia, and then the D, DVT prophylaxis. So these little frameworks that I've just got inbuilt in me mean that I can give these answers pretty well. And Look, I suspect that most, if you ever get a prize exam in anesthesia as a medical student, you will get scenarios like this. There's a, uh, what is it, a pain stuff, anesthetic plan stuff, and uh, you know, what we're going to go through the doctor's ABCD one. Yeah, I think that covers that really well. Okay. Uh, and those were fantastic approaches. The last scenario, as we sort of were saying, is focused around sort of an A to E, an assessment of an unwell patient. <laughs> So the scenario was you're an intern, you're on sort of evening ward call and your met pager goes off. Um, you arrive at the scene, you happen to be the first responder. Um, you have a chat with the ward nurse and she sort of says to you, thanks for coming. Um, this is Anne. She's, you know, 69 years old. Uh, she had a vaginal hysterectomy around two days ago. Um, she's now tachycardic and she's also hypertensive. So her blood pressure is only 80 on 55. Mm. How would you approach this patient? And what would be some things that you'd be looking out for and be worried about? Yeah, great. So uh, as we were talking about this before, I really like the fact that you knew straight away, this is now stabilization of a sick patient, which is doctor's ABCD. It's not history examination investigation. So this is this is a patient who's really unwell and it, having a potentially life-threatening incident occurring. I would immediately call a Met or Code Blue if I, if I thought I need it. And I'd get someone to contact a surgeon because they're a surgical patient. Knowing that they've had a vaginal hysterectomy means that suddenly I've got a whole bunch of really serious differentials that not only need treating, but the treatment is not just easy stuff. It's like, I need to get theater organized. So I'm already flagging that whilst I'm about to do the doctor's ABCD. So there's my first kind of summary statement uh, and then framework. I'll do a doctor's ABC approach. And most importantly, this is, looks like a cardiovascular problem. So I will, you know, go through airway, look, listen, but make sure the airway is patent, breathing, look, listen, and feel, provide oxygen, get the monitoring on and sort those things out and treat them symptomatically. But I'm really focused on this, uh, on, the, on the cardiovascular system. I would look at the monitor, look at why they're tachycardic, if it's um, sinus tachy or, or a primary uh, ventricular atrial tachycardia and recheck the blood pressure and as well assess the fluid status. I am most worried now. So I'm now seeing my most worried statement so that I've, I've done this whole thing where I come in and do safety stuff, which is get help and provide oxygen and give some fluids, put a drip in and some basic things like that, take a gas, take blood, you know, group and hold um, uh, and, uh, and a cross match. So that's my phase one safety stuff. My stabilization is I would give fluids um, and I'd um, you know, try to optimize this patient as any intern could. Um, and then my phase three and four is diagnostics and treatment. So before I do that, I go, this is, this is 
really concerning for a post-operative bleed because they've had a vaginal hysterectomy or sepsis would be the other thing or a DVT. So I'm thinking about a few things, but I'm most worried about the uh, bleed. So how am I going to sort that out? Looking at the drain tube, looking at the fluid status, looking at the size of the stomach, um, checking the surgical notes, and then contacting the surgeon to come immediately to assess the patient and taking, giving some fluid and taking a venous gas to get a HP result. That's how I'm going to sort that one out. Sepsis, take a temperature. Um, DVT, look at the calves, look at the, whether they've had DVT prophylaxis um, and what other past history would make this an increased risk. So for example, vaginal hysterectomy for um, a cancer would increase your risk of a DVT. So I'm kind of flagging these major problems, but really I still need to get this patient treated. I would talk about giving the fluid, taking the results, giving more fluid, um, and then seeing how this patient was with the result of that. And depending on how they're going, I would probably try to get them to ICU or to, or to you know, theater because they potentially need more intensive care, depending on what the results of what I did was. It's an, you're an intern, so you're probably not going to be giving metaraminol, but I'd be saying, look, I'd be considering giving a small dose of safer inotropes like metaraminol. Again, that's not intern level stuff, but you would, it'd be nice to be aware of that and then get a senior staff member to help you with that. I think that's a really comprehensive approach to an A to E and probably above what we'd be at, but I think excellent, as you said, sort of to have all those data points available when you go to sit these exams. Mm. Um, any A to E, I think it, pretty much just practice. It's a, it's a framework. If you go over this over and over again and before your OSCEs do them with other people and just go through all the motions of actually, mm. you know, examining the patient and mm. you know, going through your A to E, um, they become actually really easy sort of stations to go through because it is so well structured. I would almost correct myself because I reckon if I was a medical student doing, doing this, I probably would have done it differently. I would okay. I would look for danger and put some personal protective equipment on. R, check for response. Make sure they're speaking to me, short, you know, pain, voice, poo scale. Uh, send for help, which you've already done. And then because there's probably marks for going through it, I, I just did very briefly. I said airway, look, listen. But airway, look, listen, check for patency, uh, breathing, look, listen, feel, respiratory rate, auscultate, tracheal deviation, effort of breathing, saturations, provide oxygen. And you're getting marks as you're going. At the very advanced level, and more advanced levels, the way I said it is I'm quickly yeah. going through A and B. I know C is the problem, so I'm not going to fluff around with A and B. Whereas I think as a medical student, what you said, Max, was definitely you need to go through it and have practiced it beforehand so it's nice and fluent. You're, you're doing it pretty efficiently. And even getting to disability, GCS, pupils, gross motor power, and then exposure, expose the patient, you know, top-to-toe assessment and uh, temperature as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But having in the back of your mind, sort of as you were saying, when those issues arise in each, if you find an issue with an airway, treat that and then move on and move through your framework as you go. But yeah, it, it evolved in sort of that way. So airway, you know, look, listen, feel, is it patient? Are they talking to me? But overall, the scenario eventually came to the stage where you realise, oh, this patient is in atrial fibrillation. Mm. The next question they asked is, how does that explain her hypotension? Great. So this is a real physiological question. Atrial fibrillation is a fibrillation of the atrium. So now you don't have the atrial kick, which often provides up to 30% of your stroke volume from your ventricle pumping out. So not having that means that now I've lost part of my stroke volume, which theoretically then decreases my cardiac output and decreases my blood pressure, especially if the, especially if, uh, the atrial the you know the atria is now fibrillating uncontrollably and the electrical activity goes really quickly to the ventricle and now my ventricle's going fast it's not filling enough and it's just not pumping effectively so there's my pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation high ventricular rate low cardiac output equals low blood pressure yeah sounds good to me um so that physiological response understanding how that all feeds through to ending up with a hypertension was how they were sort of expecting us to go through that. Yep. And then they moved on to what are the most sort of common causes of atrial fibrillation? Yeah. And, and this is such a broad question when I think about it. So I would probably try to think of this system by system. Uh, there's a few, th a few ways you can do causes of anything. Cause of anything could be 
caned it or system by system. So caned it is congenital autoimmune neoplastic endocrine drug infection trauma. And I might think about that, but this one atrial fibrillation, I'm thinking more system by system because cardiovascular things, you know, cardiac ischemia um, can cause it um, having uh, any kind of problems with um, oxygen delivery, hemoglobin delivery, electrol abnormalities around their um, pH problems, lo- electrolyte states, lo- you know, low calcium or sodium, even low potassium, low magnesium can all predispose to atrial fibrillation. So I'm thinking about the cardiac stuff, pneumonias and infections in the lung can cause atrial fibrillation. Thyroid problems can cause it. Pheochromocytoma, endocrine things can cause it. Um, even neuro- neurological abnormalities causing increased sympathetic outflow. So what I'm doing there is systematically going through and giving a spattering of kind of things that might cause it. Um, and then I mentioned the candid. So I'm thinking, you know, infection could be one of those things. Trauma to the heart, but that's not happening in this vaginal hysterectomy case. Um, and it's, yeah, drugs as well. So I, I think I've really used the candid and system by system approach to try and merge it into a whole bunch of differentials I can go through quickly um, to try and say that I'm going to look for these and I'm going to treat them to make sure that I, I'm not just treating AF with, you know, rate, rhythm and anticoagulation. I'm thinking of the cause as well first. I think probably a great way of approaching any problem like this, if you're asked what are the causes of X to have that systems-based approach and then, you know, also how any other things might have contributed. I suppose for, for us in medical school, we learned um, Mrs. Smith has atrial fibrillation. I'm not sure if you're familiar with no, that. I'm, I'm going to hear that. Go for it. Um, so ignore the misses. That's fine. Leave that. And then Smith. So spell that one out. So S is for sepsis, as you're sort of saying, infection can cause atrial fibrillation. Yep. M for any mitral valve pathology. Yep. Um, I, ischemic heart disease. So those issues with blood supply to the heart or AMI. Um, T for your thyroid. So thyrotoxicosis could potentially lead to atrial fibrillation and H hypertension. Um, and I suppose within that, you know, that's a more chronic long-term cause, but those were suggested to us certainly as the five sort of common things that if you can remember your acunary, they're easy to rattle off in an OSCE or in this sort of exam. If you completely blank on a systems approach and having a better structure of going through it. If you can remember those, at least you've got something to say. That's good. It's, it's not exhaustive, but it gives a probably high percentage thing in, in an exam. It's worth saying, look, I think of sepsis, um, my, my kind of mitral valve stuff, ischemia, thyroid, and um, hypertension as a long-term cause, I think. Yeah. Um, good. And then if you're wrong about that with that gambit, I'd say would be called, um, then you can go through that. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like that, Max. That's Sim- simple stuff to get the high yield things quickly, I think is a really great strategy. So the case evolved from here. Um, and the next thing they sort of talked about was your MET team eventually arrives, please provide an appropriate handover. Do you have a way that you like medical students to give you a handover? I mean, this is one of the most important questions that I would have little personal input into because it's a national standard. As soon as you get a national standard for something, the you know, university definitely wants you to do a very specific way of doing it. And this is, as we both know, it's ISBAR, identify or identification, situation, background assessment, and request. Now, in real life, I've got to say, often, if you're referring to a consultant, I mean, this is my, I think this is my pretty good opinion about this, but apologies if it isn't. Identify great situation, yes, and then you go straight to the request because then the request frames the background and assessment for the consultant. And sometimes you don't even have to go through the background assessment because the consultant goes, oh yeah, we'll be right over. Like you, you're not wasting time. Like, you know, say, seven, uh, was it 60, 70 year old female situation is hypertension, post vaginal training two days ago. Please, I, I need you to come and assist with this. I wouldn't even care about the background. I'd be like, yeah, I'm on my way. You know, you can tell yeah. the background while I'm walking. Um, that, that's the reason why I put requests in there. But yeah. ISBAR is definitely the thing you have to absolutely mention and then literally fill in the gaps. Is this identify myself and the patient? The situation is hypertension postoperatively and uh, my, uh, what is it? That situation background is the past history of the patient. Assessment is my ABCDEs. And again, you've already done that. Request is I need to help stabilize this patient. And certainly from my experience, that's how consultants like you go through it. 
it's a bit of a range. Some people like that framing very early on. So I think how I would approach it is if I knew the patient was in atrial fibrillation, after I do my identifying, I say, and we've found that this patient is in atrial fibrillation or if it was something like a bleed, I'm concerned they have post-surgical bleed. And then everything after that, you know, you've already started firing off for the consultant so that everything they hear is in the context of what you actually think the problem is instead of running through your whole thing and then going, oh, and this is what I think is going on. Mm. Would you say that's a nice way of approaching it or do you like to you know, sort of leave you to make your own conclusions? No, I really like the whole give me the it's, – it's, it's kind of like give me the end point of what you think it is. And, the, you know, and the more senior you are, the more I take that into account. Um, because of, you know, you're probably more, more likely to be right about it, but yeah. So identify, it would be situation then, wouldn't it? Identify this patient as yeah. any situation is, you know, hypertension post, post-operative. I think it's due to this. Yes. And yeah. then, yeah, then go into your background assessment, uh, which hopefully supports that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks heaps for having me. I think that's, that's more or less covered off all the scenarios. Excellent. Um, and that was. Yeah, beautiful. And that's, um, yeah, it was just such a great little rundown of just really common topics. Um, yeah, um, uh, w- when do you get feedback about uh, how, how you did in the, in the, in the exam? Um, we'll see. I think there was some suggestion that they might let us know before our graduation ceremony, which yep. is on the 16th of December. Cool, cool. But otherwise, we find out as a cohort on the 16th. That's really exciting. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, very good luck to you. And uh, yeah, so what, um, I mean, that's probably comes to the end of it. We've gone through, as a summary, a few, three different very common scenarios. I think the frameworks that we talked about are very much in line for any of these frameworks, whether it's pain in a fractured femur or pain of a, you know, any other thing coming to hospital. Uh, and then as they assessment and a deteriorating patient. I think, yeah, they're just good principles to think about. And and hopefully when you go through your prior exam, you can use some of these principles and, and this approach to things. Uh, and again, a plug for the Anesthesia Foundations course, because that will that really goes through all of the stuff that I know and everything you need to know in your first 12 months of anesthesia. And I, I just keep adding to it. So, you know, I'll, I'll keep putting up little interviews like this, um, as well as all the, you know, really relevant information, everything from how to set up your anesthetic ventilator, checking your machine and um, you know, anesthesia, anesthesia medications and resuscitation. So yeah, hopefully it's really useful and really supplements all the other stuff you and all the other resources out there for anesthesia. So yeah, any any other questions, Max? Before we sign off, that oh, sounds fantastic. And I really would recommend everyone goes and checks out your course. You guys produce some fantastic content, and it's one of those specialties that we don't get a lot of teaching around and, you know, consultants and registrars from what I've seen really appreciate it. If you've done a little bit of background and have some vague ideas or some questions to prompt conversation and you might find out that you really enjoy it and it's something that you want to pursue in the future. So I think it's worth putting in a little bit of time. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> hey Max, good luck. And hopefully you do well. And even if not like you, it's great just getting into the Viva and doing things all about you know, participation and getting involved and improving. So, um, yeah, thanks for, yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast and, and grilling me with your scenarios. That was, that was great. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Beautiful. Okay. So, um, everyone, uh, yeah, please share with, share this with every, anyone who might be interested. This is here from ABCs of Anesthesia and yeah, we'll see, every, see everyone next time. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey from medical student to procedural skills from foundations in anesthesia as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.